Welcome to the 2023 Annual Meetings Governor City Stock. I'm Krishna Srinivasan, Director of the Asia Pacific Department of the International Monetary Fund. Today, I'm honored and privileged to welcome uh, Governor Shaktikanta Das of the RBI, where we'll be talking about frontiers of central banking in Asia. Now, Governor Das requires no introduction, but I'll do my obligatory piece. Uh, yeah. So Governor Das took over the helm of the RBI in 2018 at a critical moment for both India and the world. And since then, he's been guiding monetary policy and banking regulation in the world's fifth largest economy. Now, during the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, he took bold and timely actions to mitigate the impact of the pandemic and to save lives and livelihoods. He's passionate about digital technology and FinTech, both geared towards increasing access of the layman or the common person to finance and to promote financial literacy. Needless to say, given this track record, he, uh, he received this year the, uh, governor, of the uh, governor of the Central Bank Governor of the Year Award from the Central Banking uh, Ceremony. Uh, before joining the RBI, uh, Governor Shakti Kanta Das was, had an impressive career in the Indian Civil Service. So Governor Das, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. So, we, we have a slight change in format. We initially thought governor uh, will make some opening remarks, but the governor has agreed to uh, answer questions rather than uh, give some opening remarks so that he has more time to, share, to answer some of your questions. So governor, uh, let's begin with uh, what we've seen in Asia. What you've seen in Asia is inflation started rising much later than other regions of the world. When it started rising, it rose much less and now it's declining faster than other parts of the world. Was that the experience in India too? And if so, how would you explain that? Yeah, I think uh, first, uh, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Krishna, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you to you personally and to the IMF. And very happy to see you all uh, this afternoon. Now, coming to the inflation uh, scenario in India, yes, by and large, what you say is right. And I think the primary, I will say in the context of India, I think the primary reason for that was that uh, the COVID time response of both the monetary authority that is the Reserve Bank of India and the government from the fiscal side, I think the response of both fiscal and monetary authorities were very calibrated and uh, targeted. T calibrated and targeted. Uh, there was no excessive uh, fiscal expansion, excessive compared to other countries because the government did enhanced substantially the fiscal targets were uh, sort of you know uh, extended during that time it was widened the government went for a higher fiscal deficit so when i say it was not excessive fiscal support in comparison to many of the advanced uh, economies and also on the monetary side we took very calibrated uh, measures uh, during that period while we provided a very strong support to the financial markets with a commitment to see that the financial markets function normally and the normal activities go on in the financial markets. So we undertook number of measures. We undertook, uh, you know, like for example, we pumped in a lot of liquidity. We pumped in, uh, we increased, we reduced the policy repo rates, the interest rates by 215 basis points uh, on top of a few rate hikes which we had done earlier. So liquidity, then we did uh, uh, rate uh, you know, the adjustment of rates, reducing the rates. And we also provided support to the lenders, that is to the banking companies and to the non-bank lenders by first offering a moratorium of six months, followed by a resolution framework with regard to the loans which were under stress. So, and all these responses were very calibrated. Just to give one example, we injected liquidity, but every liquidity, almost every liquidity injection measure was accompanied by a end date, by announcing an end date, by announcing a sunset date. So for example, when we gave liquidity, it was given for, it was given for one year or it was given for three years. So, and the lending standards, the collateral standards were not diluted. Uh, 
It was the banks which availed the credit and the collateral standards were not diluted or compromised. And right from day one, the bank knew very well that they have to return this much quantum of liquidity, say after one year or after three years. So they were able to plan their liquidity management better. So that is just one example which I am giving. So by and large, therefore, in India, the monetary and fiscal response were very calibrated, very targeted. And simultaneously, I think the supply side management and the steps which were taken by the government also during that period, it did help us to sort of uh, bring down, uh, uh, you know, it did help us to sort of see that the inflation was kept under check. And naturally, for a, due to a combination of all these factors, I think the inflation spike in India came a little later, maybe, mm -hmm. sure. uh, compared to what you were saying. In fact, I would even go to the extent of saying that uh, without the war in Ukraine, our inflation uh, you know, would have been very much within our target range. Our inflation target, as all of many of you would know, is 4%, right. with a tolerance band of 2% on either side. So in February of uh, 2022, when we did the monetary policy statement, our projection for the next financial year, 23, 24, 22, 23, that is commencing April 22 up to March 23, our projection of inflation average was 4.5%, mm -hmm. very close to our target of 4%. But then the war commenced. With that, the commodity prices just hit the roof, particularly the prices of crude oil. Then access to, you know, like the supplies of wheat and other cereals got affected. International prices went up. India, despite being surplus in wheat, our domestic wheat prices also went up because we are also linked to the international market. Right. And India does export, you know, we do export, uh, India exports quite a bit of uh, wheat also. Then the edible oil prices, a substantial quantum of edible oil which India imports from that region of, you know, from Ukraine, Russia, from that region, that also got disrupted. So I would say, but for the onset and the unexpected onset of the war in Europe, a war in, uh, you know, over Ukraine, I think our inflation would have been very much under control. So to come back to your point, inflation did set in in India for, a, you know, at a later stage primarily because of the commencement of the war and also because of the calibrated and targeted measures which both the fiscal and monetary authorities, the Reserve Bank and the Finance Ministry, which we had undertaken. Sorry for a longish answer, but I thought let me that's, put it, you know, let me put it at that. That's very clear. Now you say, you talked about sunset clauses and that's quite uh, unique to the Indian situation. Did you ever deviate from those sunset clauses? I mean, did you shift those sunset clauses ever any time? No, we did not. You know, we reduced, the, there's something called the cash reserve ratio. Yeah. We reduced it for, uh, you know, up to the month of, uh, and we announced it, I think, sometime in March. And the end date was announced as March next year. We did not extend it, but instead of a bullet uh, adjustment, a, a bullet correction mm -hmm. on 31st March, we phased it over a period of two months okay. to make the process, you know, uh, to make the process smoother for the banks which uh, uh, had sort of, uh, you know, which all the banks in fact had benefited out of that reduction in the cash reserve ratio. And with regard to the other liquidity which we had injected, we did not extend any of those liquidity measures. And uh, parallelly, you know, we were also working with the banks. I mean, that's again, maybe I will, as a part of some subsequent question, I can answer. We, will, we were also parallelly working with the banks and the NBFCs through our supervision, through our regulation, to see that that sector of the financial sector, you know, the banks and the non-bank lenders, right. they also remain, uh, you know, they remain strong and they make a quick revival. So the banks did not ask for it, nor did we have to extend it. Okay. You alluded to one point. You said that the war in Ukraine uh, kind of led to a sharp rise in prices. Now, we've had a series of shocks, right, from the pandemic, then we had the war in Ukraine, the commodity price shocks. In this context of series of shocks, how have we been able to balance price stability, growth, and financial stability objectives of the RBS monetary policy framework? Actually, if you see over the last five years, we have seen a, a series of, uh, you know, sequentially a series of uh, shocks, and some of them were also quite overlapping. 
In the second half of 2018 calendar year, there was the failure of a large non-banking, non you know, non-bank lender. Mm -hmm. That created a lot of stress in the financial markets, and the financial market activity almost came to a standstill. Liquidity was also under a lot of pressure, so we had to address, and that whole of 2019, it took us to adjust to manage that situation. Mm -hmm. So we did that by, you know, very, uh, we had a very, uh, very close monitoring of all the non-bank lenders. The top 100 non-bank lenders were being monitored at my level on weekly basis, and we tried to inject liquidity, and we ensured that there was no other failure of a major non-bank lender during that period. And we did it by active supervision, by working with the non-bank lenders, and by commencing work in doing a kind of a correction in the regulatory architecture for the non-bank lenders. Because earlier, it was a kind of a light touch regulation. So we moved towards a greater, uh, you know, towards a greater, uh, you know, greater focus on prescribing regulatory standards and making the regulations somewhat more, uh, you know, strict, especially for the larger ones. That was 2019. 2020 was COVID. 21 was the Delta wave. 22 yes. was the Ukraine war. And 23 has not ended. And too many things are happening all around. So that is the kind of uh, crisis which we have uh, gone through. But uh, in all this, I think what has helped us is uh, what has really made, uh, you know, enabled us to manage this situation is that uh, we have always been proactive. We have tried to identify the problem and we acted before the problem actually occurred. For example, during COVID time, uh, in the month of March itself, when COVID was just setting in, and uh, you know there was a state of uh, uh, there was a state of uh, what should I say lack of. Uh, clarity in everybody's mind as to what this uh, virus, virus is all about, what kind of damage it will cause. But very proactively and I think with somewhat uh, great boldness on the part of a central bank which is supposed to be very conservative, I think displaying some sense of uh, some kind of a boldness and in a, with a lot of proactiveness, we announced a moratorium on repayment of loans to banks and to non-bank lenders. We were clear that we, we will do it for six months, but we announced it in two phases. First, we gave three months because we thought we'll see how the virus plays out, how it behaves. And if required, we gave it for another three months. So this came before even there was a demand from the market, you know, asking for some, this kind of a relief. So we did it proactively. And then we came out with a resolution package. I mentioned to about yes. it earlier, a COVID-19 uh, COVID resolution package to address the problem of stress in the banks. And when we came out with the resolution framework, it was not a kind of open-ended framework where it was free for all for the banks to restructure the loans any way they want. We formed a committee, and the committee prescribed certain financial and operational parameters which the lender has to achieve post, you know, after the, uh, you know, post restructuring of a particular yeah, loan. Yeah, yeah. When you restructure a loan, then let us say the period of restructuring, we said, should be not more than two years. And these are the financial and operational param parameters which the borrower has to achieve. In other words, it also entailed a kind of a responsibility on the part of the borrower himself to bring some additional capital and to do some internal uh, business uh, corrections. So therefore, our actions have been, by and large, we have tried to be proactive. We have tried to sort of uh, been, uh, we have been also, I would say, quite innovative. We mm -hmm. came out with a uh, lot of uh, measures. And during that period, in fact, uh, already this was work under progress, but we almost completely recast the regulatory architecture for the financial sector. Right. We came out with new governance guidelines for the banking sector. We made a certain man, you know, made it mandatory for banks to have uh, uh, the risk management uh, at a particular level, to have a chief risk management officer at a particular level. We issued guidelines for the functioning of the risk management committee, the audit committees of the board. So we carried out a big governance reforms. We issued guidelines for governance reforms in the banks, both public and private sector, that is both government and non-government, you know, private right. banks as well as government-owned banks. 
this non-banking lenders also we came out with a scale-based uh, regulation depending on the size and complexity we categorize them into four categories because you have very small non-bank lender and you have big non-bank lenders which sometimes are as large as a mid-sized uh, commercial bank. So we came out with a scale-based regulation for the non-banking sector. We came out with, we have come out with new digit, you know, new lending guidelines for the digital lenders. We have also come out with new guidelines for asset reconstruction companies, right. for core investment companies. So almost every aspect of the financial market you know, various subsectors in the financial sector, we have come out with new regulatory, uh, completely we have recast their uh, regulatory architecture. So, and the process of supervision also has been substantially tightened, mm -hmm. in uh, substantially tightened, and it's very, very active today. We no more wait for the uh, you know, we no more wait for the symptoms to sort of warn us. We have now early warning exercises. We do deep dive into the business models of banks or non-bank lenders and try to identify which are the potential areas of risks. And we sensitize the banks or the non-banks. We don't do micromanagement. We don't unnecessarily So this early interfere. warning is new? The, Sorry? The early warning uh, is a new phenomenon you use? Early warning system internally was there. Okay. It was not as if the Reserve Bank was doing it for the first time. It was there. But we sharpened it and we further uh, tightened it. So on the financial sector, we focused. Liquidity, I have mentioned. Rates, of course, in response to inflation, we have sort of again increased the rates when the need arose for that. And last but not the least, very important, during this entire period starting 2019 till now, and the process continues, we have built up a strong forex reserve position in the Reserve Bank. Right. Our forex, forex reserves <clears throat> have almost been increased by 70 to 80 percent. We today stand, our reserves stand at around 600 billion, a little less than 600 billion as per the latest uh, number, but it is around 600 billion US dollars. And uh, in the beginning of uh, 2019, it was just about uh, uh, 390 or little less than uh, 400 billion dollars. Right, right. It was a conscious decision to build up the reserves as a buffer, as an insurance against the spillover risks. Yes. When you have capital inflows, there will be a day when there will be capital outflows. And in such situations, every country, especially emerging market economies, which always face the consequences of spillovers of actions or what's happening all around, the spillovers are felt maximum by the EMDs, by the emerging market and developing economies. Ultimately, these economies have to look after themselves. And India, with a huge population and with the size of our economy, we have to be self-reliant, we have to be self-dependent, we have to have our strong reserves. So with that objective, we have been building up very strong reserves and in fact, that has given great confidence to the market that whatever be the challenge, India will be able to meet its external sector obligations. And that is something which did help us, even this time around after the Ukraine war, when the, there was depreciation of the, you know, when the US dollar suddenly became very strong and all the emerging market currencies depreciated. The Indian currency, the Indian rupee did not depreciate as much because the market had confidence that the Reserve Bank, that India will be able to meet its obligations. And even during this period, we were intervening in the market. I am saying it openly. I will not hesitate to say for a moment that we do intervene in the market, but our intervention is both ways. Sometimes we uh, you know, buy the dollars, sometimes we sell dollars. It depends on which way the market is moving. But our objective is not to fix, to have the rupee at a particular level. We don't have a particular level of the yeah, Indian yeah. rupee in our mind vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. We don't have a specific exchange rate in our mind when, with regard to our currency market intervention. What we are attempting to do, and this has been RBI's philosophy and approach over the last uh, several decades, 
our approach and our focus, our emphasis is to prevent excessive volatility of the exchange rate. Because once you have, you are able to provide stability to your currency, once you are able to achieve a kind of a orderly depreciation or appreciation depending on where the market moves or depending on what is the overall global and domestic situation. It has to be an orderly movement of the currency and there should not be excessive volatility. So that is what we have uh, sort of ensured. And as a result, uh, and we are quite open about it. And in fact, this is one area where I think it is necessary for, uh, you know, for agencies and others who do this labeling of uh, market intervention. I think it's a time to rethink, you know, to call uh, somebody as, uh, to put somebody on the watch list or to call him a manipulator or to, uh, call it, uh, call the currency a stabilized currency. I think there is a need for rethinking and I feel there has to be a two-sided appreciation of the challenges. We have to get out of our one-sided approach and interpretation of such concepts. I'll stop here. Thank you. Very casual intervention part. Uh, that was very useful for, for us. I think that's a message to the IMF. <laughs> yes, I, I, I could see that coming. So please uh, review it. <laughs> I could see that coming. And, and just to push on this a little bit uh, on this one, uh, when you talk about meeting monetary policy objectives, when I raise this issue with other central bank governors, one issue they bring up is that close coordination between the central bank and the fiscal authorities. And sitting uh, in Washington, I feel that that coordination has worked very well in the Indian context. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how that's how you see uh, that? No, I think uh, I must say that uh, there has been excellent coordination between the central bank and the finance ministry, that is between the reserve bank and the government during this entire period especially after the COVID right. and uh, I mean, especially we, after the onset of the COVID and uh, very active engagement. But take the example of the inflation, for example, inflation management. We have been able to deal with the problem of inflation, I, I should say effectively, because of close coordination and understanding, close engagement between the government and the Reserve Bank. The latest number for the month of the inflation number, the consumer inflation number for the month of uh, uh, September, which was released just about, uh, which was released just about uh, an hour ago, uh, it has come to five percent. Last year in April, at its peak, the inflation had reached consumer inflation had reached seven point eight percent. That was the peak. And then it slowly came down. In the first quarter of this year, that is April to April, May, June, we were able to achieve 4.6%. But then there were some extreme weather events. Vegetable prices went up and the inflation again crossed 7%. But thereafter, thanks to the effective measures, thanks to the active engagement between the government and the Reserve Bank, yeah. we did not, uh, when the inflation went up, we knew that the vegetable prices have gone up and it's a temporary spike and it will moderate after uh, two months. So we did not uh, do a new knee-jerk reaction of doing something on the rate side. We did not increase the rates. We had already taken a uh, pause with regard to the monetary policy with regard to the interest rates, we continued with our pause. But we were directly engaged with the government and government undertook certain measures. And because of the measures which government undertook and because of the way we have been overall managing liquidity and our you know, liquidity and by keeping the interest rates where they were, by giving confidence to the markets through our communication also, I must mention that for any central bank, especially given the uncertainty that every country today faces, I think central bank communication has become that much more important. So effective coordination between the, between the government and the Reserve Bank, Reserve Bank communication on interest rates, Reserve Bank communication on inflation, I think all these have worked together to ensure that uh, the inflation, which again went up due to a uh, spike in vegetable prices, 
government took several measures to see that the vegetable prices do moderate and they have moderated. The latest print has come to 5% and it is exactly in line with our internal uh, projections. If I remember correctly, I think uh, for the second quarter, we had given out a number of 6.4% uh, and the second quarter number, inflation number comes exactly at 6.4%. Our internal number mm -hmm. for the month of September yes. is also what it has finally come to be, you know, 5%. That's quite so therefore, active coordination between the fiscal and monetary authorities have have helped us. And I think this is something which I would like to <coughs> emphasize, not just when we are facing a crisis, even in normal times, there is need for, uh, you know, there is need for constant engagement and coordination between fiscal and monetary authorities, because both these agencies are ultimately working for the economy. So there has to be conversation, there has to be engagement, and there has to be coordination. We as a monetary policy authority, we also need government support on so many things. We need uh, certain, uh, certain laws to be amended, certain laws which govern the financial sector. We need several amendments. So we also depend on the government to carry out those amendments. And I'm happy to share and mention here that whatever amendments, etc., we have wanted, we have always got extend, uh, you know, excellent cooperation uh, support from the government. That's, so it that's, is very important that's great for all times, point. not just, I'm, a, I'm quite open about it. I mean, there is a perception that central bank, central bank must have autonomy, central bank does have autonomy. Autonomy means autonomy in decision making. Autonomy does not mean that you stop conversation between each other. Absolutely. I fully agree with both on coordination and communication. I think you raise excellent points. If I could just move to a different issue. Uh, India has been leading the front on digitalization. You know, when you talk about digital public infrastructure, you talk about digital money, digital payments, and so on. And you yourself have been the pioneer in the issue of CBDCs. Uh, and you've been piloting this, and I think now you're trying to mainstream it. Uh, so how do you, see, what role do you see of CBDCs and digital payments uh, playing in the Indian economy in terms of improving uh, financial inclusion, innovation, and efficiency? Well, thank you. I'm happy that you asked that question because uh, CBDC is going to be the future currency of the world. And it is necessary that every central bank, every country works on CBDCs. There's one reason, specific reason why I am saying that. Of course, paper currency will continue. But having said that, the world is moving towards digital payments. India has made, I think India has made excellent progress and it's at the forefront of digital payments. Our UPI, Per day, number of transactions have exceeded uh, 10 billion transactions per uh, per day. We are doing 10 billion uh, transactions. That is, uh, uh, sorry, in the month, I think. 10 billion transactions in the month, I'm sorry. 10 billion transactions per month we are doing now. The UPI is doing. Coming to CBDCs, why I'm saying it is very important? Because there are several, you know, there are now several new animals or birds, whatever you call them, they're floating around under various names. Somebody calls it stable coins, somebody calls it uh, cryptocurrencies. Our point of view is that let us be very careful in interpreting and understanding what consequences they have. On stable coins, the basic fundamental question that arises is as the fundamental question that begs an answer is whether governments and central banks are comfortable with private currency. Currency is a sovereign function which the sovereign delegates to the central bank in countries like India. So therefore, are we comfortable with private currency? So therefore, these uh, new technology products which are coming and styling themselves as great innovation, their financial consequences, their mm -hmm. negative consequences for domestic financial stability, for global financial stability, for domestic monetary system, for the global monetary order, all that needs to be understood. And we have published, you know, RBI, we have myself spoken about it, so I'm not going to list out what are the potential threats. Right. They pose a threat, you know, all kinds of threats, you know, terror financing, money laundering, apart from, you know, currencies like emerging market currencies, uh, which will sort of cause uh, the central bank itself will lose control over the monetary system. There are lots of challenges, and this can become, this are, these are highly risky. Now, we don't want that kind of a thing. 
In fact, I on such matters, whether it is stable coin or uh, it is uh, cryptocurrencies or whatever you call it, I think we need to fully understand what are the risks before sort of trying to legitimize them. We need to know before entering the water how many sharks are there inside the water. I think that is how I would put it uh, in a very commonplace language and very bluntly. Now, so therefore CBDC is important. The world is moving towards technology and CBDCs have a major role because CBDC can really facilitate efficient, cost effective and faster payments across jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. For cross-border cross payments, yeah. for cross-border transactions, CBDC can provide the solution. Even today, time is taken. Bank-to-bank -bank, uh, transactions do take time. In fact, uh, there is a cost. According to the latest estimates of the World Bank and others, still remittances cost about on an average 6% is the total cost for remittances. Now, 6% is very high. It needs to go down. In today's technology era, it needs to go down. So CBDC can provide a solution to make cross-border payments faster, more efficient, and uh, cost effective. In India, Reserve Bank, we started the wholesale CBDC uh, pilot project in November last right. year. And the retail mode, we started in December. In the wholesale, initially, we started with uh, secondary market trading in government securities. Now we are extending it to overnight money markets. That is the wholesale segment. In the retail segment, we have now millions of customers who are enrolled into the pilot project. Almost every bank has been onboarded. The trials are going on. It's a learning experience for us. And the learning process has been very satisfactory. And every day there are new challenges which come. We try to understand what is the problem. So we are really taking it forward in a manner. And on this, we are in active discussion also with other countries which are uh, carrying out similar efforts. So now it's just about going to be a year of our, uh, one year of our CBDC pilot project. The learnings have been excellent and more than what it was one year ago, we are even more convinced that CBDC can prove to be the most effective and efficient uh, mode for uh, cross-border payments in particular other than, of course, domestic transactions. And this is not something which is very difficult. In fact, in India, we have a small uh, you know, vegetable vendors who have been enrolled into this CBDC pilot project. Fruit shops, small vegetable vendors, they're all onboarded. And we have, in India, made uh, our CBDC and the UPI interoperable. Right. Yes. So it is not necessary that for, CB, uh, for uh, CBDC, you have, for the e-rupee, you have one uh, QR code, and for UPI, you have another QR code. In fact, UPI, first we had streamlined the QR codes. It's a common interoperable QR code. Now the same QR code is interoperable with the CBDC. CBDC. So naturally, the efficiency of the system improves. Great. You know, when I used to go to India uh, very often, I used to feel like a dinosaur because I was the only one carrying uh, currency. Everybody seemed to have a digital wallet. So this time at the G20 meetings at the RBI Innovation Lab, I got a digital wallet and a CBDC wallet and 4,000 rupees in free as part of your piloting. So this was really good. Thank so you. I don't know how much time I have. You could continue this conversation. Uh, I want to leave some time for questions from the audience. So maybe I can open up the uh, floor right now. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see everyone from clear very clearly. Uh, we have a question right here in the front. Could you please introduce yourself and keep your question brief? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ambassador Tunde Aritunji. I'm a professor of anthropology. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, with the diaspora. The equation I'm introducing to the world is Brain drain to bring gain. We're listening to the governor. You did very well because your foreign reserve has actually reached 600 billion. And you are able to have checks and balances on currency depreciation. And you are very much interested in the global currency stabilization. That's what you said just now. The growth of any economy is predicated on the proper interplay between the human creative abilities and natural resources. Africa matters. Africa is the future. 
and Africa is the emerging global opportunity of the world. The president of some countries from Africa feasted in there, and they are looking for global stabilization of their currency. Most of the African currency are depreciated, especially the largest economy in Africa, Nigeria. The equation of dollars used to be 63 cents to one dollar. It's now 1,000 Naira. Ambassador, could you please uh, ask a question? Now, my question is, what will the largest economy, the central bank of in Asia, do in the context of globalization of stability of currency with the emerging marketing opportunity of countries of the world? What will you do to stabilize this? Well, frankly, I see uh, our role in such situations uh, being limited to sharing experience. Because, uh, I mean, I, uh, I don't have uh, detailed knowledge of uh, what is happening in each of the African countries. But broadly, we know that Africa, what is happening in Africa, and you are very right in saying that Africa is the future. In fact, in recognition of that under Indian presidency, the African Union has been you know, admitted as a permanent member of the G20 group. That is one of the major milestones uh, which Indian presidency has achieved. So we do, in it, you know, we do recognize. But other than sharing our experience, how we have done it, uh, I see a very limited role for us because uh, uh, and ultimately, it is for your authorities to come and discuss with us and pick up some uh, experiences and uh, some uh, uh, takeaways from that. It is essentially for a multilateral forum with the, like the IMF, with which we also work very closely. I think it's uh, global safety nets or global uh, stability, macroeconomic stability, monetary stability. These are all issues for the IMF. So IMF is really the right forum, and we do uh, have an active engagement with the IMF. So I think you have to really look at uh, bilaterally gaining experiences from countries, including India. I mean, there are other countries also which are doing, uh, which are doing very well, and uh, also engage with the IMF. Beyond that, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, I would not like to go beyond that. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I'm told that we're out of time here. Uh, I do apologize. We have to stop uh, at this point. Governor, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your uh, ideas and wisdom with us. Uh, it was really useful for all of us. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you very much.